famous historian of revolutions, George Roudet, on my left, and his wife, Doreen, on my right. As a team, they have been together for many years producing books. Uh, Doreen, of course, has been the uh, lady behind the scenes uh, who's helped George in so many ways. And George has done his work in particular in England and in Australia in recent years. Um, he's very, getting very close to retirement now, so it seems that uh, it would be a good time to have a quick look back at um, his career, some of the books that he's written on revolutions, and uh, also to ask him uh, some very general questions about revolutions. So I was wondering, George, if you could just, uh, we could just start off by you telling us about uh, how you started to write and where the first book came from, which I think was The Crowd in the French Revolution. Yes, certainly. Well, I think I wouldn't have written that book unless I'd been of a slightly revolutionary temperament myself. I don't appear <laughs> so. I'm a very quiet person. I don't hurt many things, but uh, I was disposed that way in England, and uh, I came to study for a second degree at London, which was in history, before it was modern languages, and uh, the idea of doing something on the French Revolution came at some time, and particularly to study who were the people who took the Bastille, who were the people who uh, knocked off Louis the Sixteenth's head, who fetched the king and queen before that, of course, too. Uh, from Versailles and who the crowd, in fact. So it came to be called the crowd in the French Revolution, a title that I didn't invent myself. But when I thought of the title, revolutionary crowds, uh, the uh, the Clarendon Press said uh, that would sound as if crowds were running around in circles. So they banned that one, and I called it the crowd in the French Revolution at their suggestion. Did it borrow from Gustave Le Bon's book on the crowd, 1895? Uh, not very much. I reacted to him, but I didn't borrow from him. Mm -hmm. Well, why, why, why make the crowd the focus of the, the first book? Uh, was there a feeling that mass movements were something in the 20th century that uh, you wanted to take, make a study of? Well, it, it was uh, fairly obvious to me, studying the French Revolution at the earlier stage, without any uh, arrière-pensée about writing about crowds, that uh, the one thing people hadn't done who'd written about them, they were always talking about Le Peuple and Les Journées and people uh, going down into the streets, but they never said who they were. And if they were friendly to them, they called them the people. And if they were unfriendly, as conservative and other historians nearly always were, they called them the canaille or the mob. And it was fairly obvious at closer inspection, and there was no particular genius involved at closer inspection. It was only a matter of initiative and asking new questions. Mm -hmm. But I found that there were people like craftsmen in the Faubourg Saint Antoine, and they weren't necessarily bloodthirsty maniacs, nor did all their wives sit knitting their shrouds at the guillotine or anything like that. So I came to study this and uh, found this fairly fruitful. And to my surprise, I found after doing my doctorate along these lines that uh, nobody else really had done it. So mm -hmm. I turned it into a book on a slightly wider field. Mm -hmm. Does that, uh, was that an attempt to get away from uh, a kind of an elitist approach to history where you have Danton, Mirabeau, uh, Robespierre, people at the top uh, being the focus and the center of many, many studies? And uh, yours was an attempt, in a sense, to sort of put a balance or a shift of focus into your study of, say, the French Revolution in particular? Well, it started, really, trying to see if there was any uh, working class component in the French Revolution. And the first uh, the thesis I did was on this, on the workers in Paris. But I found there was no conclusion. There was nothing that came out of this, mm -hmm. because they were, in fact, part of a lot of other people that became called the sans culotte. Mm -hmm. And so when I turned it into a book, I did the sans culotte as the center of it, uh, or the people in the streets. But uh, it's right that uh, I did try and get away from this other approach. But it, that evolved because the great man of history from uh, below was a Frenchman, Georges Lefebvre, mm -hmm. whom I met in Paris after I started working on this. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, in a sense, I adapted what I was writing to his thought. Mm 
except I'd done my thesis before then. I'd finished that before I saw him. Mm -hmm. I'd started, no, I hadn't, I beg your pardon. I was starting on the writing of it when I met him. Mm -hmm. And uh, his writing influenced my work. Uh, so between that and my own disposition to see what the ordinary people were in history, uh, I got onto it and I've been on it more or less ever since. When you say that you had a, a revolutionary temperament yourself and that oriented your mm -hmm. early inquiries, can you tell us about that? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that I belong to left organizations mm -hmm. in England. Mm -hmm. I was anxious to change the government by any means, mm -hmm. uh, by any means short of elitist overthrow. Mm -hmm. It had to do with mass movement, mm -hmm. but uh, this naturally led into that sort of attitude towards history. Mm -hmm. And uh, this undoubtedly played a part. I don't think it's essential for this to happen. In America, the people who've written what I sometimes nowadays call crowd history have been sometimes liberals or of the right. Mm -hmm. uh, in England, they've always been of the left. Mm -hmm. People like Edward Thompson and Eric Hobsbawm, Christopher Hill and so on, they've all been of the left. Mm -hmm. When you were in Paris, I understand you met up with two other young men, Sobel and Cobb, who were beginning their careers. Can you tell us about the three Musketeers? Well, if, if he's not listening, I don't <laughs> mind you calling him Sobel, but <laughs> uh, Sobel and Cobb. Yes, uh, it's true. Lefebvre did on one occasion call us the three Musketeers as he saw us coming out of the archives together. If I remember, Sobel borrowed a cigarette off me, never had any himself, <laughs> and uh, Cobb, <laughs> don't think he smoked. But uh, I was the eldest, but they'd been at it longer because I was a late starter, mm -hmm. very much later than they were. And uh, we uh, wrote about the same sort of thing in different ways. Cobb wrote about the, what was called the Revolutionary Army, which were the army of civilians uh, from the, recruited from the sans-culottes, or the craftsmen, who might say of Paris, mainly Paris, that uh, went around uh, demanding that uh, more bread was uh, kept for the army and for the people in the towns, more uniforms for the army, and church bells which were melted down for cannon, things of this kind. They were a very radical organization. And Cobb, who's a uh, sort of anarchist or radical Tory, very much a Tory, has always been that, he's much more so now, he got very hooked on this and uh, wrote about this with a f almost fanatical glee about some of these characters who were really wild men <laughs> that suited his temperament very much. Sobul is uh, quieter and more erudite and certainly more in the French tradition of history writing and very much the professeur, but um, <coughs> he knows more about the revolution than anybody else alive. He was Sobul, he was Lefebvre's uh, on, only lasting pupil, I think, mm -hmm. who survived, uh, who survived the first things. I mean, he had other pupils, but he never created a school. Sobel's the only man who's really come out of it as part of the school. Uh, Cobb and myself were linked with, through uh, him, with Lefebvre. Mm -hmm. Often, I've never been Lefebvre's students. It's all been through private conversation, and he began to read his books after I'd started work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mathieu's the other great French revolutionary historian was the man I started reading at first, and Cobb was uh, very much influenced by quite a lot of other people first. Mm -hmm. I think, Doreen, uh, you mm -hmm. were telling me uh, the other day about uh, George's uh, first uh, uh, forays into uh, Paris and uh, his life on, uh, was it the left bank? Uh, well, it was the Place Dauphine, yes, and a little hotel that looks as if it's going to fall over but it's defied time and those sort of prediction is still leaning in its funny way there when George had a small grant to go from England. The English weren't exactly over generous with their grants. It was 70 pounds. No, I didn't. I had 25. 25 pounds. <laughs> oh, from the London always, County Council. That's right. It spoils all my best French. stories, that character. Uh, well, there you go. Uh, 25 pounds was the first time in my life I never exaggerated. So you can put that one down. All right, 25 pounds, that makes it worse, so you'll all be crying any minute. And uh, that meant not many breakfasts, uh, not many lunches, and and um, the proprietor of this hotel was an extremely nice person. He was the proprietor and he brought up a breakfast one day and George looked hungrily at this tray and um, said, that's not for me. And this character said, oh yes it is, my wife sent it up. <laughs> so great joy. So we always remember Henry IV as being, uh, apart from one or two other reasons, 
um, as being a pretty pleasant hotel in a good to starving intellectuals. <laughs> so remember that if you ever go. Put it down. Yeah. Um, that book of yours has been translated into all sorts of other languages, hasn't it? Uh, it's one of the ones that is that is um, the best known, I'd say. Would it be? Yes, the I think so. It's, it's, uh, it went into Japanese pretty early, into Italian, and into German. And uh, it's not out in French yet, but mm. uh, it should be in a few months. Mm -hmm. The French it, are not good at that sort of thing. You looked at all sorts of different kinds of records for that book. Uh, yes. You looked at. You went to the public record office. Uh, I understand the daily. Not, uh, not for that book. Not for that one. No, in the Archive National mm -hmm. and the Bibliothèque Nationale. Yes. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I wrote most of it in the Bibliothèque mm -hmm. Nationale mm -hmm. while I had another job on. So it was the next book, wasn't it, Wilkes and Liberty, that mm -hmm. uh, looked at all sorts of different kinds of uh, sources, the electoral voting rolls, yes. the public record office in London. Yes. And that was the one that really, in a sense, I guess, put you on the map after the um, the crowd in the French Revolution. I understand you wrote that in Adelaide. You Most of it, yes, all except the first chapter. You yes. had gone from England, uh, uh, where you had been teaching school, yes, uh, to Adelaide, University of Adelaide, yes. And uh, you want to tell us about that? How that happened? Uh, yes, I, w I. Most of my teaching life has been teaching in high schools, uh, all sorts of different ones, like uh, boarding public school, mm. English style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, day public school, English style, St. Paul's School, Kensington, very well known. I parted company with them over a little political matter. Um, <laughs> then to uh, grammar school, English style. <coughs> then to a comprehensive school, English style. All of these were in London, mm -hmm. except the Buckingham School, the Stowe, where I was first. And then I got the, uh, after writing the first book, I got invited to, I put for in, I'd put in for many jobs at universities, and this one came right, senior lectureship at the University of Adelaide, which mm -hmm. wasn't until 1960 when I was already getting on a bit. Mm -hmm. But I understand the thing that uh, was a kind of a turning point in your career was the Royal Historical uh, Society's prize, the Alexander Prize for your work on the Gordon riots. Yes. Well, I don't know whether, what it did for me, except uh, they gave me a silver medal and uh, I was rather surprised. <laughs> I just failed to get in the year before. I understood I was runner-up, and that I went in again with another one and got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just one of the various studies that I'd got into after the crowd in the French Revolution, applying the same methods. Mm -hmm. But as the uh, records in England are quite different, for the French Revolution, there's a multitude of records that uh, Sobul and Cobb used even more than I did because they'd been longer at it, which are police records mm -hmm. and tell you a great deal about the people who are arrested or killed or hospitalized through riots and things like this. In England you get very slight information about these things till about 1830 mm -hmm. with the convict records in Australia when you begin to catch up with the sort of material that you had in England. Mm -hmm. That means that in England my focus had to shift from the uh, poor craftsmen or mm -hmm. porters and servants very much more to the middling sort of people like the electors of Middlesex who returned Wilkes, mm -hmm. whose names were in rate books, riot tax and so on. And I could do something on that so that the, what I wrote was always determined by a combination of the questions I asked, naturally, mm -hmm. and the materials available. Mm -hmm. And if the materials weren't available, well, you had to get asked questions about other ones instead. So there must be always this connection. And the third partner is the archivist or librarian mm -hmm. without whom mm -hmm. I couldn't live. Doreen was telling me a funny story about one of the uh, archivists at the public record office in London. Yes, he was a Viennese, was a Viennese, mm. wasn't he? Yeah. Um, an elderly Viennese with a certain protective attitude towards George, <laughs> which had 
um, something to do with the way he expressed himself in England, something to do with his character. And he liked seeing George there every day. He was practically part of the fixtures. And uh, he used to call it Master George's greatest embarrassment, which I gather it makes more sense in German. Um, what did he call you? He had this lovely name, George, for you. you a lovely boy or darling boy. <laughs> a um, baby boy. Baby boy. It's even worse. It's and even you know, worse. this man was they, two months younger than me. They, they, yes. Uh, well, that's, so the bit. that's the funniest bit. Mm. Rather yeah, bit. George is rather rather bit faintly odd, embarrassed. <laughs> Uh, looked down at his shoes, but he meant it very well and loved seeing him. He's retired now, hasn't he? Yes, he's retired. Mm. But that book, Wilkes and Liberty, uh, got wonderful reviews. I think oh, A.J.P. Taylor had oh, something marvelous. wonderful to oh, say yes, about Oh, yes, he did. He said he'd leveled the in he was an innocent stick of dynamite who'd leveled the stick of namerism and put back the mind into history. That's not bad for a review, is it? Put back the mind into mm. history. Well, yeah. yeah, it's quite untrue. <laughs> I well, didn't at all. I wasn't dealing anyway. with mind. I was criticised by Eric Hobsbawm precisely for not putting mind into it. So <laughs> well, that know. gets the it's a nice Classified. balance sheet. <laughs> That's, That's right. right. One it's way a nice or the balance other. sheet. Yeah. <laughs> so following that, there was the there was revolutionary. Europe and uh, then the crowd in history which uh, I understand both though well the second book was certainly published in America and both those books were sold very well I understand yes. um, the crowd in history how does that uh, move away from what you did earlier with the crowd in the French Revolution Where well it includes it you see it includes the English things like the Gordon Wright's Alexander Price mm -hmm. book uh, thing and it included uh, the Wilkes material, it included what other people had done along similar lines. Mm -hmm. And I tried to make a study of the whole thing and a comparative study between England and France in what I call the pre-industrial period, roughly mid-18th to mid-19th century. Mm -hmm. So it was based on this. It was, uh, on the one hand, it uh, told the story uh, of the events which were these riots, disturbances, revolutions within a similar context. And then in the second part, I discussed what I call the anatomy, as I had done in the first book too. Mm -hmm. So it was based on the same idea. First of all, the narrative, what the French called l'événementiel, and then the questions uh, and the problems and the analysis, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, nowadays I believe they call problematique, but they didn't call it that at the time I was writing it. Mm -hmm. So it was this mixture of two things. So it was, the, the presentation was similar to my first book. And uh, the, what was new about it was that I entered to some extent into the regions of sociology. Mm -hmm. I studied a bit of sociology. I wrote an introduction which was largely addressed to sociologists. And the book was more reviewed by sociologists in the United States than by anybody else. Well, but that was just a bit on the side. The social yeah. sciences march on. I understand that the shame of that is that even though there's a big demand for the book, uh, it's uh, out of print at the moment. Well, it's ran out of print last year, and mm -hmm. I don't know why. I wrote to ask, and they haven't mm -hmm. told me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very hard for me to say whether there's a demand, but it would be useful to have it around. <laughs> and after that, you wrote all sorts of other things. You wrote uh, something on Captain Swing. With Eric Hobsbawm, mm -hmm. yes. That was about the English laborers of 1830. Tell us about Captain Swing. He sounds well, so it's, a, it's, it's got a swinging title, pardon the pun, <laughs> and that's why a lady we know uh, on one occasion found it in a ship's library between uh, Adelaide and uh, England. And uh, she, she'd already read it because uh, she was the sort of lady who did read history books, and I lent it to her, and she was fascinated to find it was in the ship's library with uh, quite a lot of other sorts of literature which she didn't expect it in the company of. Sorry about that sentence. So she inquired and they said, oh, but it's a pirate story, surely, with a title like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was called that because uh, Captain Swing was the mythical hero who wrote threatening letters to landlords and farmers, uh, threatening to pull their house down or to... Uh, what burn their ricks, wasn't burn it? Burn their ricks mm. uh, and destroy them with th uh, threshing machines if they wouldn't voluntarily put aside, put away, or destroy or dismantle their threshing machines in different parts of England. So the essential issue was the introduction of th threshing machines in the south of England. Yes. And that's what it was about. We called it Captain Swing because the 
Uh, that was the name the movement was naturally given. The only surprising thing is, uh, in the same way, nobody had ever called a book Wilkes and Liberty before, so nobody had called the, <laughs> this theme that people had written about um, Captain Swing before. Mm -hmm. And Hobsbawm is a great expert at, at synthesis and analysis and also at agricultural history, so he was it was very useful that we had a partnership of this kind. That went down very well. You told me about Hobsbawm, but I understand his uh, nemesis is Hartwell. Have you met Hartwell? Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I like Hartwell. Max mm -hmm. Hartwell. From Newcastle they, in Australia. We sort of whip in yeah, the that's right. there. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. From Newcastle School teacher in, in New South Wales. Now he's editor mm -hmm. of what? The Oxford Economic Review? No, the uh, Economic History Review. Economic History Review, yeah. which comes out of Oxford, eh? He's in North uh, No, College, that's it? Cambridge. Is he? Isn't mm -hmm. it? I think so. so I think it's Cambridge. Cambridge. He's yeah, still it's editing that. And uh, yes, he is. He's I understood that, that those two were somewhat opposed to each other about their interpretation of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> yes, it's uh, the sort of main issue is whether the Industrial Revolution raised or lowered the standard of living of the ordinary people. And the people who said it, it raised it are called the optimists. Mm -hmm. And they include Max Hartwell, who is the leading big mouth for, the <laughs> for that school, and the leading spokesman, because he doesn't shout about it quite so much, is Eric Hobsbawm of the other school, the pessimists, mm -hmm. which are the people who say that it, uh, the standard of living probably fell for a while. But uh, it's very hard to prove it either way. You, you wouldn't take a stand on it yourself? Well, I tend to uh, stick uh, to work along with my mates, uh, <laughs> such as Eric Hobsbawm and uh, E.P. Thompson, mm -hmm. and I think we, I'd more or less agree with them. Mm -hmm. and I think their evidence is more convincing, and I don't think they're nearly as rigid as, mm -hmm. uh, the, as, the, as Hartwell, who tends mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. dig in. Be dogmatic. But he's very good friends with friends of ours, mm -hmm. friends of mine, I remember, Mr. Hill and so yes. on. I remember going to a lecture in Newcastle called The Anatomy and Pathology of Historical Controversy by him. Oh. And oh, really? <laughs> Uh, by the time you'd finished the title, the lecture was over. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> um, yeah, you went good. on from there to do some a large coffee table type book, Hanoverian London, mm -hmm. which uh, I understand was a beautiful, beautifully produced thing. Well, it was well set up, well illustrated. With yeah. Hobsbawm as well? With that one? Oh, no, no, yeah. no, no. I never worked with him again. Mm -hmm. Well, we could have done now. Mm -hmm. The book I'm doing now, I might do with him eventually. No, not that sort of book. This was a set piece, part of a series. Um, L History of London mm -hmm. uh, by Secker and Warburg, mm -hmm. which was very much uh, uh, for libraries and not at all the sort of history I'd been doing, but I tried to put my sort of history into it. Mm -hmm. But I rather came down on some things and I got heavily criticized. Not that it matters. Well, uh, you called Wedgwood by the wrong name, if you can call that being heavily criticized. <laughs> Perhaps I called him Sam instead of Bert. Or oh, whatever. yes, you did, yes, <laughs> instead of De Shire. That's, De Shire. Uh, mm. But that's the problem. I, uh, I yeah. mean, the, to, to be able to read everything well enough to please people who are particular, for whom that is their particular speciality. Yes, I was warned of that when I took it on. Mm -hmm. Somebody said to me, oh, I'm mad to take this on, mm -hmm. because uh, you should make certain, anyway, says so that the sort of history you've done on popular history and so on, that you make that play a large part. Well, I made it play as large a part as I reasonably could. Mm -hmm. There were certain things like the streets of London, topography, population, mm -hmm. and fashions, and art, and God knows what, that I had to put in. What about uh, the sorts of sources being used by uh, the new left historians in America at the moment, the uh, William Appleman Williams, Walter Lefebvre, people like that? What do you mm -hmm. think of the kinds of evidence they produce for the various many theory. They're, they've come in for criticism. I wondered where you stood on that. Or what well, I don't know William Appleman, Appleman Williams uh, stuff very well, not because, simply because I don't really go in much for mm -hmm. foreign policy. Mm -hmm. But, um, and therefore I can't really discuss the materials they use. I know that he has fallen back a little on the sort of little America thing, like saying, if only Jefferson, uh, what's his name, uh, I mean, the Confederacy had won in the American Civil War, it would have been a blow for democracy. Well, I don't go along with that. It would have been a blow for the slave owners in uh, South America, but 
Mm -hmm. I mean, so I don't call that very liberal. I don't call it even very radical. Mm -hmm. But he has been radical. Mm -hmm. But I think the, 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 the really radical historians are the ones who are rewriting the internal history of America, particularly mm -hmm. of the American Revolution, and asking the question, what about the ordinary people, the mechanics and the sailors in the streets of Philadelphia and so on, what about them? Haven't they, didn't they have something to say about the American Revolution? Therefore giving it a kind of popular third, fourth estate dimension, mm -hmm. again following the French example. And slavery being rewritten too? Slavery has been rewritten in two ways. One is in the relations between the slaves and the masters and the sort of ideology of slavery which Genovese has been writing about from a left point of view, mm -hmm. though the extreme left would kick him in the teeth and say he sold out, mm -hmm. because there's so many splinter groups in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. And the other people who are more typical of the left are um, right, no, sorry, uh, about slavery, there are the people, the computer people. Yes, mm -hmm. well, time on the cross. Yeah. Time on the cross, whose main theme is, well, slavery ended because it didn't pay anymore. And how do you know it didn't pay? Because you add up all the bits and pieces that make for profit. And if it's not profitable, it disappeared. And the human element and slave pressures or humanists or do-gooders and all their activities count for nothing. You know, it's mm -hmm. a bit like that. Mm -hmm. But that's very different. That's not the left. That is a new right that's playing with computers more. What do you see will happen to the new left? Uh, is it... Uh, is well, it the new left won't join up in one thing, I don't think, very easily. I don't see that happening, but they've produced some very good history. Mm -hmm. But I don't think their, their quality has been of the quality of the English left history. Mm -hmm. People like Edward Thompson, mm -hmm. Hobsbawm, mm -hmm. Christopher Hill, I mean. Yes. There's nobody of that yes. caliber, in my view, in the United States writing at the moment. Mm -hmm as stylists, certainly, being able to... Oh, no, no, they are not stylists. Mm -hmm. The English are stylists. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you, you were saying that Hanoverian London may have come in for a little criticism, but I understand that 18th century Europe uh, got good reviews, that even though it's now... Also, that got in terrible reviews. That one did? The, yes, in the Observer, it got in the hands of a man who had written a travel guide for Italy. <laughs> And he found that I got the dates wrong of the churches, <laughs> things like that. And the whole thing was based on the mistakes I'd made in the chapter called the arts. <laughs> but he only was concerned with the tactile and visual arts. Mm. He wasn't concerned with what I'd said about theatre or poetry, nothing at all. So it was, I thought, very one-sided and unfair. Mm -hmm. But of course, sometimes uh, an author feels reviewers are are unfair because they're touchy. I don't think I'm very touchy. Well, I was just but, reading uh, uh, Durant's uh, complaints about J.H. Plum. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> every time he tries to write synthetic history, the, right. uh, the specialists tear him to pieces. So yeah. you're just going to carry on regardless, oh, yes. I guess. I know one has You're uh, in good company knobs. then, yes. George, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. No, Plum's been kind to me so far. He's not likely to review me anymore, but still. <laughs> Robespierre, that was extremely well received in America. That's the better in America than in England. Mm -hmm. Yes, it mm -hmm. won a book. Uh, it's sort of book of the month thing. It had and New York a book prize type of thing. I didn't get any prizes. It was no, put on sort of shortlists and things. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. and uh, sold off as uh, as Braille for the blind or. Something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it had one or two good things, but mm -hmm. it didn't sell terribly well. What did you say about Robespierre that was uh, in any ways different from the kind of sea green, incorruptible image of Carlyle and other people? Well, I suppose the uh, what I said about Robespierre that was uh, different from the general interpretation of Robespierre wasn't so much that he wasn't a bloodsucker, because that the French have done plenty of de bloodsucking. You know, buveur de sang, and, mm -hmm. but that he was uh, an extremely practical politician. He was uh, didn't live with his head in the clouds, as uh, Carlyle, for one, believed, mm -hmm. and as many of the French historians like Michelet believed. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's justified. And although he dressed in this uh, old-fashioned Ancien Regime way, which made him look uh, as if he was uh, trying to. Uh, establish and maintain old regime standards. It's simply that he was a very uh, or elegant, well-dressed, anti-hippie style uh, member of the petite bourgeoisie of the old regime and carried these, this method of dress and this type of uh, outlook really into the French Revolution. So why could Talleyrand get away with it and uh, Robespierre not? 
Well, because Talleyrand was a great drinker, a great changer, he wasn't a man of any principle. He kept changing his line. Robespierre had a great deal of principle, brought him a lot of unpopularity. Mm -hmm. uh, Talleyrand uh, could uh, t chew what's the, whatever you do with your cloth, you cut it to the mm -hmm. situation to the cloth or tune mm -hmm. it to the wind or mm -hmm. something. <laughs> but he did, uh, he was the man who did that very well. And he was really without any principles. And he hadn't got the talent of Robespierre as a political thinker. Well, I was just reading a very laudatory account of Talleyrand, a, a book that came out by a Frenchman recently, sort of hero-worshipping thing, but it seemed to me that he was a particularly amoral person and uh, in the mm. sense that uh, he didn't seem to have any loyalty to anyone but himself and his own survival, yeah, from sure. what I could see. Yeah. The last uh, of your books is Protest and Punishment, and I have a little selection from it there. Um, this is the book you've always wanted to write, I understand, or have, have wanted to write for some long, long time and have had to put it off for this, that, and the other reason. Yes, in a way that's true. I say in a way because it's been hanging fire. I started working on it as, as soon as I got to Australia in 1960, mm -hmm. and it's only appeared, uh, it only appeared in, in uh, Oxford a month ago. But uh, it took a long time to collect the material, mm -hmm. and I found as I went on I had to collect I spent a lot of time in Sydney on the Irish. I had to spend a lot of time in Ireland on the Irish. I had to spend a great deal of time back in England on the English and the, and the Scots and the Welsh. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Canada on the Canadians who were sent out as convicts to Australia. So the operation was not only in Australia, mm -hmm. where it hung fire very often because I was doing other things. And if I was out of the country, I couldn't be working on things in Australia. But then also, then I found I had to fill in all those gaps mm -hmm. outside in the countries which were the motherlands of the people who were sent out as protesters, as convicts whom I called protesters mm -hmm. because they were social and or political protesters and not mm -hmm. the common run of convicts which gave me about 3,600 uh, subjects and gave, out of which there were 150 odd Canadians, but mm -hmm. more like uh, 2,500 Irish, the rest were English. So the, the thing about your book that is interesting for us at this time is that it has an Australian content, it has a Canadian content. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I've heard people say that they appreciate the fact that when you're in the country uh, where you're doing some work or study that you oblige the historiography of the place by actually writing about the country that you're in. And yeah. here is at last some uh, uh, rude, the rude touch uh, applied to Canada and I think many people are very appreciative of that. And, uh, I know that uh, the Quebec Association of Teachers of History will hopefully be able to reproduce some of the stuff that you've done there on the Canadian side of things. Well, I found it easier to uh, do this for Australia because uh, after all the convicts weren't sent to Canada, they were sent to Australia. Mm -hmm. And therefore I had to get to grips with the problem of, uh, you know, what happened when they were there, how often, how, whether they got back to England or Ireland or Scotland or Wales or Canada and so on, and those were problems. And uh, in the case of Canada, it was much simpler because I just had the people who were transported, as, which is the uh, uh, Australian technical word for sent overseas, deported, uh, for uh, taking part in the rebellions of 1837 and 8. In fact, they were all uh, deported for uh, taking part in the rebellions of. 1838, the second group, mm -hmm. second batch. They were and, in Tasmania, uh, essentially. You know. The Well, all the, uh, uh, not the ones from this part, not the ones from Lower Canada, mm -hmm. the ones from Upper Canada were sent to Tasmania. Mm -hmm. And they were mainly Americans rather than Canadians who came over the border to lend a hand. Mm -hmm. George, what about some of to get some land. Sorry, what about some of the names on the monument in the cemetery here in Montreal that my hands nearly dropped off trying to copy down <laughs> during those lovely amiable winters? Well, <laughs> the, the snow those are the names only of the Lower Canadians. The Lower Canadians, And they're yes, all they, uh, French Canadians, they're, they're yes. Quebecois. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they give the names of the people mm -hmm. who uh, fell in the various battles like uh, like uh, Saint-Denis uh, Saint and uh, Saint-Eustache. Uh, this happened in 30, 1837. Those who were hanged, uh, like Lorimer, Hinterlang, uh, various people, about 15 were hanged. 
and the names of eight who were shipped unlawfully to the Bermudas and brought back again because the Lord Durham had exceeded his instructions. They were rather lucky. They came back. Mm -hmm. and then the 58, most of whom were French Canadians, there was one American among them, who got sent to, uh, to New South Wales. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is a bit surprising, because I had the list of all of them, was to find that there were five names missing. Mm -hmm. So I made inquiries from, uh, I'm sure you'll mm -hmm. know the gentleman's name, Laurier Lapierre, La uh, distinguished and uh, <laughs> uh, historian and fly-by-night of, uh, <laughs> of <laughs> McGill University. And he, uh, when I was at McGill, talking to the students about this, saying, wasn't it strange, he said, well, didn't you know, they fell out with the church, so they couldn't be put up on holy ground. So that's why five were missing. Mm. I haven't read your book yet because it's, uh, it's only just appeared, but uh, I, I remember reading that distinguished historian Pierre Burton has a chapter on a gentleman who was sent to Tasmania, I think, and came back and became commissioner of police. Well, he became head of prisons. Head of prisons, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. chief inspector of prisons. Mm -hmm. His name was Pierre Xavier. What goes with That's Xavier? Francois. Pierre. Francois, probably Francois Xavier Prieur. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And he is buried on the foot of the monument mm -hmm. up at, uh, in the, I was going to say Père Lachaise, on the Côte des Neiges Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to uh, open up the last part of this uh, interview to those guests who've kindly come along to um, listen to us speak and to ask you some questions, George. So uh, no, no. I'm sure someone in the audience would like to, to ask something. I would like to ask you a question about the way in which, uh, let's say, writing for the American people, right? Yeah. Tends to look upon today's radical movements. In particular, I'm referring to some of the statements made by Armstrong, precisely, in his latest book, uh, Revolutionaries, in which he analyzes the behavior of the French students during uh, the May, May 68. Yes. And it tends to be very harsh in them, saying that you know, they didn't know what they were doing and uh, they were not true revolutionaries. And uh, now, the, the statement made by uh, Con Bennett, uh, the, the leader of the students, is precisely that uh, it was the Marxist elements that really crushed, well, the, the socialists and the communists especially, the bureaucrats, that really crushed the spontaneous element in the French student movement. Well, don't you think that there is quite uh, um, a contradiction in the way to look upon history, well, from when it is past, and the way to, uh, to look upon history when it is happening? Well, how would you react to that? Well, I think it would only be contradictory if he'd allowed the commune, the French, the Paris commune in 1871, to get away with it because it was past history then to blame the students for committing the same mistakes. But I don't think Hobsbawm would do that. I certainly wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would uh, uh, say that the commune uh, didn't ensure its success. It failed to get in touch with the peasants uh, substantially. I mean, this was a joke there. Feeble attempts to get on to various peasants, uh, villages and places and sort of make noises, you know, just to satisfy the, the leaders or whatever. And also because they didn't take over the bank and they uh, were adventurist. And they paid an adventurous man and a lot of the, those old style revolutionaries of the commune didn't want any organization. They were like the students. Well, the students, uh, as Corn Bendit said, they were spontaneous. But you can't run a revolution by being spontaneous. You must have enthusiasm, but you've got to have organization. And uh, Hobsbawm is very sympathetic writing about anarchists, about what they want to do, but he's very severe when it comes to them having any possibilities of success mm -hmm. with that sort of movement. And the students tended to be anarchists. Of course, some of the other, one of the reasons the students failed also was because by being so open-ended, they let in a lot of really louche characters, particularly at the Odeon, where you had some of these Katangane people running around with revolvers and there were people mm -hmm. killed. There were, there were some crooks in that lot. It wasn't the, the leaders went like that, but they let them in because they were so freewheeling and open. That's, uh, that's, I feel that really, so I think I would share the criticism while I would feel sympathy with the students. Mm 
I have students like this. <laughs> Can I ask you another question? Yes. Uh, and then you know, I will uh, uh, allow other people to, to ask questions. Mm. Well, my question is this. Uh, how does an historian feel about uh, the role that the mass media you know, play upon the shape, well, uh, upon shaping uh, well, the views of uh, le public en général? You know? uh, don't you think that really the impact that you, know, you might have in uh, redefining the approach to uh, the analysis of history is really very, very limited in the sense Sorry, that... Sorry, uh, what did you say before history? For redefining... Well, the approach. Yeah. The approach to how to analyze history. You know? Yes. Then you find that uh, actually the impact of uh, a, sc a school of criticism, you know, like that uh, you spoke about before, Upspam and uh, other people, yeah. it really is very limited in the sense that uh, people are constantly bombarded daily uh, from, you know, from another point of view, which tends to legitimate the, well, the establishment in power. So how do you, how do you feel, you, um, how effective do you think your role can be as an historian? Very ineffective, largely, except among a small group who tend to be fellow historians or fellow social scientists and students. And students' uh, memories of what they learn in the classroom is fairly short, except in times of, of a great crisis, like the French students in 68. They had other things to keep their classroom memories alive, except, of course, they were largely out of the classroom. You have set that against it. I don't think the mass media do anything for this sort of teaching. And when they have people like Hobsbawm or Edward Thompson or, say, myself, uh, doing talks about revolutions, uh, they have them on at 6 in the morning. This has happened to me at Ottawa at 6 in the morning. Who's going to listen anyway? Uh, or else they have it in the evening. It's only a very occasional. Mm. And also they tend to have some very nasty types, uh, from my point of view, who distort things a great deal, who are put on to talk about these subjects. So the general public gets very confused. And of course, naturally, the general notion is that revolutionaries are bloodthirsty lot of creatures. They don't uh, have to be anything like that at all. I mean, obviously, an obvious case is someone like Napoleon, who wasn't a great revolutionary, though he had all sorts of other qualities, uh, spilled a lot more blood than Robespierre or any of these people ever did. So, that's what I'd say just for the moment on that one. A lot has been said about the impact of the, uh, of the French Revolution in terms of the enlightenment, enlightenment effect of the French Revolution in fulfilling the ideas of the Enlightenment. I wonder if you could give me some idea of the extent to which the French Revolution did fulfill the ideas of the Enlightenment and to what extent it was a reaction against these ideas. Well, I think that's a very good question for them. I'm being, uh, being uh, what's the word, paternalistic. but. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very important one. I think that the Enlightenment, if we mean uh, above all the political Enlightenment, Rob's, uh, sorry, uh, people like the Abbe Morelli, particularly Rousseau and uh, Montesquieu, <laughs> and Voltaire very much less, I think they had a very big influence on the ideology <coughs> of the Enlightenment, which at some stage or another did percolate down to the masses of the people, particularly in a big city like Paris. But of course, in the process, those ideas got uh, assimilated and distorted. And by distorted, I don't mean that's a bad word. I mean, they adapted them to their own needs, which is only natural. And uh, so indirectly, a lot came out of it. More directly at the top, the sort of things that Rousseau was after, the sovereignty of the people, was more realized through the French Revolution than any other revolution. Of course, it was interpreted in different ways. It went through the period of the terror and the dictatorship of the Jacobins, but they were still very much influenced by the ideas of the Enlightenment. Uh, the notions about education came through people like Condorcet, who were philosophers of the Enlightenment. A great deal of the sensory psychology, which you have in Locke and in Condorcet and Condillac, came through the Revolution came through the Enlightenment right into the assembly. A lot of the ideas of, on education, which were discussed there, came from people like Condorcet. Uh, so I think the influence was very considerable, but it would be sentimental to imagine that it had a great deal of influence on the peasants or on the small people in the towns who had other traditions. <laughs>
which had very little to do with the Enlightenment. And remember, the Enlightenment had very little to say about the common people. This is, some people imagine that, you know, people uh, like Rousseau were very keen on the little man, or that not really. Political, as a political idea, sovereign to the people, that the people for him was an abstraction. Uh, I take it that you uh, regard yourself as a revolutionary historian, um, and uh, uh, you, you said uh, earlier on that uh, you got into this uh, um, study of the, the crowd in the French Revolution because you had certain revolutionary tendencies yourself. And I was wondering if uh, you had, at any stage, looked at some other, perhaps less well-known revolutions, such as uh, those which have taken place in Russia and Spain. Uh, and um, the reason why I would wonder about that is that uh, possibly there, um, there is more material for um, uh, a person who is really concerned about the input from, uh, let's say, the people as opposed to um, the uh, revolutions about which you have spoken. Uh, and um, uh, you, you said a few minutes ago that uh, um, the attitude of Hobsbawm towards uh, anarchists was pretty contemptuous. And um, I, I wonder whether he has uh, looked at um, such events as those which took place in Kronstadt, for example. and. Um, whether uh, you would share his uh, opinion about anarchists, or, well, they're nice chaps, idealists and all, but, uh, you know, don't let's take them seriously. Mm. Uh, how, how would you respond to that? Well, I, I wasn't qu quite sure whether you meant that I thought his opinions were contemptuous, or whether he was contemptuous about the students in 1968, because I, uh, it was the second thing I was saying. I wasn't disagreeing with him generally on that, but, um, yes, I have have some nodding acquaintance with a whole series of revolutions in Spain, including the most recent one, uh, the, one the events in Portugal. I follow with great interest, and uh, the Russian Revolution, naturally. And uh, I know about the Kronstadt sailors. And I know the problems as between the Kronstadt sailors and the Bolshevik government. And these are certainly things that I'm interested in, but I haven't written about them, and I haven't been involved in them academically simply because I have only been teaching and writing about revolutions in a pre-industrial context. You see, it's not because I dislike the idea of doing anything on them. I like the idea of having students who are working on all these things, as in do I do. Cuban Revolution, Algerian Revolution, I've had students on. The Canadian rebellions, which are not exactly, uh, not exactly revolutions, but they have elements of it. So I wouldn't say no to anything. And I realize the temptation uh, of a historian on the left to uh, consider unimportant movements of the right within revolutions or movements of the right outside revolutions. But I'm not so much a revolution historian as a crowd historian. And crowds can be of the left or the right. Mm -hmm. But they can be phony crowds. They may be mobs, but you can have the people uh, with political ideas and idea and thoughts in their head, uh, whether on the right side or the left side of the political spectrum, and I'm interested in both. The Gordon rioters were not exactly the great uh, patterns of uh, liberal democracy, naturally. They were hostile to the Catholics, for the mere fact that they were Catholics. I'd be interested in studying events in Belfast. I don't feel any sympathy for either the Catholic or the Protestant Belfast who murder each other off. I, I suppose I could sit back and say it's an interesting movement. You've got, to, you've got to analyze it, you've got to see how something can be done about it. And I think historians of revolutions can play a certain part in, in anticipating uh, uh, the way in which people may behave. One doesn't have to be terribly learned in revolution history to Imagine that the Shah of Persia was likely to get a knocking at some stage, though one perhaps wouldn't have imagined that it would come from the extreme right, from the church. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that uh, what one does learn from history is that most revolutions start from the top and work their way down, 
And the fact that the Shah is under fire by an organization that includes this man who is calling for blood, 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 as a kind of human sacrifice, much the same way as the Irishman Patrick Pierce talked about the Easter Rebellion of 1916 in that mystical way, it doesn't mean that it can't lead to something which I would think slightly better, because it does broaden out into something else. So I feel committed about revolutions as well as being interested in them. Okay. Actually, uh, the last sentence about the Shah was uh, the main question I wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned uh, previously in the discussion that you are interested in uh, the sociological aspect as well as the yes. historical one. Yes. So I would like to get your uh, historical understanding and if you really to see the past to tell us a little bit about uh, the future of the situation in Iran. You may not label it as a revolution, but I can see the seeds of the revolution exist in the whole situation, uh, considering also the aspect of the modernization in Iran. Because I think it has to do with uh, the process of modernization, which Shah starts, and then you know, he wanted to you know, develop one aspect of society, cons ignoring other aspects as well, and keeping the same structure and the same political system in a traditional aspect or traditional system. Well, I suppose like many other people observing in the sense of hardly, I'm hardly an Iran observer, but uh, noting it in a vague sort of way from outside, I was expecting the movement to overthrow the Shah to come through the uh, labor unions and uh, through the sort of support they get abroad or from liberal elements rather than through the church and the very strangely mystical leader they have. But uh, I haven't been, I, I can't anticipate except that it would seem to me very strange indeed if this sort of manifestation which brings two million people onto the streets as it did either yesterday or Sunday uh, can be controlled by the Shah who hasn't the forces to do this and if the, the counter Shah movement is organized through the religion it is fairly obvious I would think that the socialists, communists, the other secular bodies and people involved in anti-Shah activity would be joining in with them. And one can't see, obviously, exactly where that will, what will lead that organization in six months' time. And I mean, I would only guess like anybody else. Because one thing I do strongly believe is that, although I have read quite an amount of social scientific uh, writing on revolutions, and I've read various models that have been put forward, which I've generally uh, not been happy about. And I think the what's happening in Portugal, what's happening in Nicaragua, what's happening in Persia are illustrations that you cannot have a model for a revolution which you use as a kind of uh, crystal ball and you say, well, you have elements one, two, three, four, five, we've got up to nine, the next three must follow automatically. It just isn't like that. I don't think Marx uh, ever thought of revolutions that way. I'm sure Lenin never did. Um, and it's only really uh, slightly, I think, uh, half-baked, um, self-styled social scientists, very often, who believe this. I don't mean by this there's nothing that can be gained from studying the past. I mentioned one thing which I think is useful, and that is the uh, likelihood that revolutions will except possibly in industrial societies, which uh, the Shah Persia strangely is a mixture, but it's essentially a non-industrial country. Uh, it's uh, funny to say that with all that industrial wealth coming in, into it, but as, high, as far as the mass of the population is concerned, this isn't an industrial culture. Well, uh, you can say that there, as in France, as in England in the 17th century, as in all sorts of other places, the rupture tends, the break tends to come from the top and then down. It's, and that is happening. I, I think the only example of recent years that seems a little different from that is Portugal, where you had a very strong movement to the left almost immediately. And then the right sort of pushed that back. That's unusual. But then revolutions are always unusual. George, in the last uh, minute or two that we have left,
I wonder if I could uh, just uh, say how pleased we all were to hear that uh, a Rude seminar had been set up in your honour at the University of Melbourne last year when you were there. I know you were rather ill at the time, but it was a wonderful honour. It went for a week, I understand, with uh, all sorts of papers from your old students. You had been chairman of the department for some years at, uh, in Adelaide, and um, all of your various and many students came back with papers, I understand. That's so good. Oh, yes, they were all now professors or assistant lecturers. It was all very extraordinary. And you thought of these people in the 60s, and there they were running departments, and they'd all been spread out all over Australia. Well, you're a wonderfully satisfying experience and a, a wonderful honour, and it I understand was. that will be a regular. Uh, I don't know how long it'll go on. Every two years <laughs> it's supposed to. I don't know if I'll be there anyway. But, uh... Well, I wonder if I could ask whether or not uh, you have an opinion about Quebec. Uh, we've been through supposedly a quiet revolution. I know it's an awful thing to ask you your opinion on Quebec in one, or one minute or a minute and a half, but do you think you could talk to us about the future of Quebec? Well, it is a difficult one. The Quiet Revolution is uh, something very positive, but it's not a revolution, really. It's, uh, de uh, it's dealt with two things, the status of the Catholic Church in, in Quebec, uh, whose, uh, uh, whose strength has been cut down a bit, which I think is useful. And uh, secondly, it has carried through, to some extent, what people have called a language revolution. I don't believe you can run a revolution on the purely through language. And I think there's so much more to do if you want to do a revolution. I think that uh, René Lévesque is a fine man. He's the most honest politician I've seen around this place or in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, he is the, just about the best politician I've seen around. But uh, I don't think he can single-handed carry through what's needed in Quebec. And I think that his followers, some of them, know very well that when it comes to the social problems, he is very weak. It'll be a bourgeois. Uh, government, which will run through bourgeois measures, the socialist measures won't come unless they do something much more drastic. For, for Quebec, in revolutionary terms, you wouldn't obviously anticipate a bloody revolution. I wouldn't what? anticipate it. These things can happen Unantici unanticipated. Mm -hmm. I don't think the uh, Cossette Trudels are going to get up to a lot of uh, gun yes. shooting and fighting when they come back. Yes. A lot of these people, Paul Vallier for one, are uh, going it extremely uh, well in a quiet sort of way. I don't think that the, if this is visible on the scenes. I think it's much more likely that somebody is going to intervene from outside and uh, prevent the Quebecers getting to what they want rather than the Quebecers are going to take up arms for anything themselves. They may have to fight for self-defense. This is something else. So, um, can you just quickly tell us where to from here? What are you writing? Where will you go uh, in the next uh, year or two? Yes, I can do that very easily because I've started writing a book which I've been on, which I've been lecturing on for three or four or five years, on and off, which I'm calling Ideology and Popular Protest. That is, I'm interested not only in what the people at the bottom are doing, but what's in their heads, and it uh, relates to the fact that they have to have ideas of their own as well as the ideas that are superimposed upon them by political parties, religious leaders and whatnot. Well, George and Doreen Rudet, all the very, very best for the future. Thank I know you. that uh, you'll Thank continue you. to, to write for some years to come and everyone will be looking forward to those productions. We hope you'll come back from Australia to Quebec and visit us here again at Champlain College and that uh, sure. Thank you. once again we can interview you sometime in the future. Of course we will. Delighted. <laughs> Especially if we get coffee. <laughs> That's right. Especially if we get coffee. Oh yeah, sure. We promise not to bring you any kangaroo skins, however. <laughs> no.